What is the problem? Never mind. That's fine. They don't taste anything like it. That's false advertising, right? I want goldfish. You ever get like an animal cracker and it's a hippo? Oh, hippo. No, it's like a cookie. <laughs> it's garbage, and I'm tired of it. That was on film. All right, so uh, take out the draft of the Declaration of Independence. Let's talk a little bit about that. I know the bell about rang. Let me phrase that. The bell rang yesterday. I know. These are the last two center blocks. What are you doing with them? So students years ago, actually not that long ago, broke it, got into my room somehow and bricked up my door. <laughs> they had the whole door with cinder blocks. It was pretty funny, but they wanted to surprise me, but since they all wanted to watch my facial expression. When I saw it open the door and there would be bricks, they were all standing there like watching. I figured it out. Something's going on. So we had all these bricks and then I walled them. We had fun with it, but that's all I wanted to do. Then I got four bricks. That's the case it was an earthquake. No, we have to rebuild. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the draft of the Declaration of Independence. I actually can read that and go through it like historical content. Every time you read a document, you'll check who wrote it, try to get glean as much information as you can from there, and get into the habit of that for everything. It only takes a couple cent or a couple seconds, but get into that habit. It's not that big of a deal. If you don't do that, then it becomes harder to understand. It becomes a word salad. Read it; it'll help you out. So, glean information from that, you get something. Because you know who Thomas Jefferson is. That alone should give you probably a pretty good idea where this is going. You know, this is part of the Declaration of Independence. These are some of the grievances. We know that stuff. You, at least you should have remembered this stuff. Next, I asked you to look at context. Didn't I? I said the bell rang, so I asked to jot down a couple things about what's going on. Did we do that all the class with the bell rang? So, what are the things that are going on at that time? Big picture that led to the Declaration of Independence. Give me some. Anything. What's that? Is it, uh, oh, Corsi back, yeah. Corsi back was another one. What? Another one. What's going on? Corsi back, what else? Tea Party was another one. Lost the Massacre was another one. Common sense population. Say it again. Common sense. Common sense. Good. Is there another one? What Congress wrote this? Second. Yeah, Second Continental Congress. What else do we know? All the branch petition. Hmm? The king ignored and said they're all going to be what? Disemboweled. Yeah, disemboweled. What city did the British just leave? Boston. Yeah, so they what the heck? Let's declare independence. Who was the philosopher who did life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Or pursuit of property? John Locke. John Locke. Every one of those. You know, or at least I bet you know 99% of those, right? Every one of those you do. Think about that, then when you read the document and now context, you know what they're talking about. If you would if you read this cold, especially the way it's worded, it would have been almost impossible because I want to apologize. Wow, is it weird? The worded weird. Too much alliteration there. But it's very weirdly written. Go through and take a couple of sentences. This is called brainstorm. Just think of a few things. It helps you out a lot. And you might think, oh, well, we just did this. I don't need to look through that. Well, first off, you do. Well, it takes a couple seconds. But let's say down the road, you get an essay topic that you, from a while ago, you don't remember. It might be somewhere in your brain. You better start brainstorming stuff around that to give you an answer. Because if you just start writing and don't know what you're talking about, wow, you're in trouble. Always think historical context as much as you can. Big picture of what's going on around it at that time. So. Next, audience, we have a good idea. He's writing about, you know, this is the Declaration of Independence. Who's he writing it to? What people? 
Hmm? Who's that? Of who? So part of the new United States, new United States, who else is he writing to? Yeah, the British and the French. Yeah, they want to get other people involved in the war. His point of view, we know he's a patriot, he's a philosopher, but let's get to the purpose. The purpose is of all of the historical context are the two most important ones of those. And with that, we got to read the documents. Everyone follow along. And yes, I apologize for the wording. So two things. First off, remember, there's no dictionaries. So they kind of make up words. And secondly, nobody spoke this way. This is not the way people spoke in 1776. When you look at legal documents today, people don't speak that way. He was trying to write this in very high English. He's actually copying Shakespeare a little bit. He's trying to show that this is a document for the elite. People did not talk in this horrible way. There's one clause in here that just blows me away how complex it is. So everyone, let's follow along and I'll read this. By the way, it actually, the original was he half. He half waged a cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere, or to incur miserable death in her transportation hither to here. Either means to here or to there. Now, who's he talking about? First off, who's he? The king of uh, Britain. King George the Third. Yep. And he's implying you know, this is all British policy, but you know, focus on the tyrant, the king. But who are these uh, people that he captivated and either brought into slavery or they died in the horrific Middle Passage? Who are these people? Slaves. Slaves. Those are the slaves. How, why did people trust him if he had slaves? We'll get to that. Good question. Yeah. If you thought they were called, and I understand where you can see that. And people, you misread something, but they're slaves. We're talking about slaves. But come back to the colonists. Remember, this is someone trying to say that the colonists want independence. Don't forget that. So, the why slaves. Why did he only capitalize the person? There's no. There's no grammatical rules yet. So, yeah, I know. It's, yeah. The king went to Africa, captured slaves, brought them to the United States. Did you catch all that? Even before the king was alive, the king was doing this, according to the stock. That's what we call a busy person. He's doing all of this. Was the king doing this? Oh, sure. Britain profited. But really? The king did this? Now, it says, determined to keep and open a market where men can be bought and sold. All right. Oh, before we get to that, did you notice that? So we're talking about slaves. Look at that first line again where it says violating, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in persons of the distant land. Who, according to this, have rights and liberty? The slaves. Well, wait, what? Are you saying the slaves have rights? This is why it's not. That means are the slave, are the slaveholders depriving them of their rights? When Adams and Franklin read this, that's all they got to the first line, and they said, no, and crossed it out. Because if it came out that the slaves have rights, who will this offend and they might never join this new country? So, all of the new states, especially even Jefferson's own home state. So that's why Adams and Franklin crossed that out. But then let's get to the next thing. Where are we at here? He has prostituted his negative for suppressing every legislative attempt to prohibit or restrain this execrable commerce. It's an interesting way of saying it. Prostituted means selling their morals. Which is a, a very loaded statement for a lot of reasons, but that's what he's saying. And, but gave up his morals. Gave up his morals to do what? Who wanted to suppress this trade? What people? This is the important thing. Who wanted to end the slave trade? According to this document. The king has suppressed... Um, 
suppressing every legislative attempt to prohibit or restrain this execrable Congress. Who is Jefferson saying wants to get rid of the slave trade and therefore slavery? Who? Say it again. The people that. Where? No, in the United States. In the colonies. You have to I know it seems kind of weird, but what he's saying is the people of the colonies want to get rid of slavery, and the king won't let it. Is that true? No. no. That's what we call a lie. But this is propaganda. The Declaration of Independence was a lot of propaganda. They said with some embracing philosophy. It's propaganda. He wants people to think a certain thing about the king. And in fact, he gives the commerce a name. Did you catch that? This execrable commerce, meaning the slave trade is execrable. Anybody know what execrable means? Do you know what excrement is? Do we know? No. Do you know what poop is? Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> We're all there. Yeah. So he's, he's giving us the biggest insult he can come up with. The biggest insult he can come up with. So, the people of the colonies didn't want to have slaves, but the king is making them. That implies that the king has forced them to have slaves. They don't want slaves, but the king is making us. He went and captured them and then forced them to have them. We don't want slaves. And that includes what person? Thomas Jefferson. And of course this is a lie. He had over 200 slaves. He could, have done, he could have done what at any time? Free them. He could have freed them at any time. But of course he didn't. Yes. Is he writing this to make like a common hatred for the king? Common hatred. For the king? Yes. To hate so the king. kind of like Hitler. <laughs> well, any propagandist could, could do <laughs> something like this. They're, they're, they all don't necessarily have to be Hitler. but So... He has, okay, where are we at? Okay, then we get to pass the bracket. And then this assembly, this is a great one, after the second bracket. Look at this clause. And that this assemblage of whores might want no fact distinguished die. No fact of distinguished die. What does that mean? <laughs> Dear friends, look at that. I'm just going to move on. That is basically, he's not going to let the whores of the slave trade go. Away. You guys, it's here. The king is making this. What a horrible way of saying it. Isn't that just awful? I look at that clause every time. Every time I read that, I'm like, Ugh. He is now exciting those very people to rise in arms amongst us and to purchase that liberty of which he had deprived them by murdering the people upon which he has also obtruded them. So let's go back and look at that. He is now exciting those very people to rise in arms among us. Exciting means to incite. And what is the king inciting? For the slaves to be part of the So he's offering them freedom if they fight against the, the patriots. And to slaveholders, that's inciting a what? Slave rebellion. slave rebellion. And who are they going to kill in this slave rebellion? The masters. And why do the masters have slaves? According to this? Because the king made them. So the king has this very elaborate plot to go to Africa and capture slaves, force them on this horrific journey to the Americas, make colonists have slaves, and then when the time is right, have those slaves rise up and kill the colonists who he forced against their will to have slaves. It's kind of smart. That's what happened, isn't it? In fact, the king did it starting back in 1619. 140 years before he was even alive. That's dedication to a cause. <laughs> Thus paying off former crimes committed against the liberties of one people with crimes he urges them to commit against the lives of another. Wow. He's blaming the king for slavery. So what's the purpose of this? This is actually, I bet some of you are going to be close, but this one is, wow. What's the purpose? After you read this, what does he want you to believe? First off, the king's back. We know that. But what? Backtrack. Who are the victims? The colonists. The colonists are the victims. Everyone got that? No. 
the king deprived the colonists of their liberty by making them have wives. Right. In a way, then what else is he doing? He's justifying the colonists having what? Slaves. Slaves. Did you catch all that? That's the two things he did there. He's justifying the colonists having slaves by saying, we have no choice if the king made us. And then, we're the victims. And that's why we had to go back. Did anyone get close to having the end of the purpose? Did you get, please, hopefully God blamed the king for something, right? That's, but we, after I read through that, does that kind of make sense? Wow, that's a pretty impressive little bit of logic there, isn't it? Smart guy. Duplicitous and dishonest to make that sometimes. Je Jefferson really has a lot of the contradictions in the United States, all wrapped up into one person, good and bad things. It really is Thomas Jefferson. He's an interesting guy. He knew slavery was immoral, but he didn't want to give up the slaves. So he tried to this convoluted reason why he had it. Because he couldn't admit that he was a horrible person prior to slaves. He didn't want to admit that. Do you think he treated them as bad as other people? Oh, yeah. Wait, what was his... Let's thing? put it this way. The best, the best um, condition for slaves would, would be hell on earth. The best. Because the whole system relies upon terror. The, the, the constant threat of being beaten near to death. That's how the whole system works. Some are going to be obviously more than that, some will be less, but it's all hell. What was his convoluted reason for having slaves? He liked to stop no, it's convoluted reason. He kept on trying to say, I didn't want to do this, but they made it. Oh. We'll get to that. That's where racism is going to come in. Racism will become the justification for slavery. People who are lighter skin must be on top, darker skin on the bottom, therefore they're not really human. Therefore, it's not bad. Like, like. So, did the colonists believe this? Did they think the No, that's part of the reason why Adams and Franklin crossed that out. Because they thought no one's going to really believe this. We all know that's garbage. No! Boom. So this whole thing was out? Yep, the whole part. This was going to be one of the grievances. That's a good document. I thought it's a good one to practice on, but it also gives you an idea how you can be close, but then to read through it and go through it. It really is weird. But also, let's say you get a word like uh, opprobrium in the third line. A program of infidel politics, meaning Muslims, even though Christians... Uh, Christians enslaved people too, but Muslims in what is now Turkey, there was a big slave trade at that time. A program just means uh, basically a characteristic, but it's a word that no one uses, and it's actually, if you look up in the dictionary, it's not defined very well. You come up with a word like that, especially in, especially in an old document, what do you do? Don't say punt. Don't say, ah, I don't care. Try to look at the other words around and see if you can infer what the meaning might be. But if you can't do that, try to get, you know, of course you can. Don't just skip it and don't get out of the habit of doing that anymore. Because the more you skip, the less you know. Then it becomes really easy to just kind of word and move on. That's bad habits. But I know most of you don't do that because fifth period is just amazing. Okay. If they're watching, I just want to make sure they do. So would you like to do this with another document? Turn the whole thing over. The whole thing, the whole package. Oh my goodness, there's another document. Okay, it's Federalist number 10. That's, that's what you guys said, number 10. So you do have to read this. This is propaganda for, for ratification of the Constitution. It's written by James Madison, who's considered to be the father of the Constitution. He's trying to lay out good things in the Constitution to convince states, especially New York, to ratify this. So... It's not necessarily the truth. In fact, you're going to find this out when you read documents. They're all biased. They have a certain point of view. They're rarely fact. And sometimes the bias can be just they leave stuff out. Here, he wants people to believe great things about the Constitution. So he's writing. This is one of many Federalist papers. We're only going to look carefully at this one. In AP government, it's that you look at a lot more, which makes sense. But... He's laying out things that he believes people will go back and say, wow, we got to wrap up this Constitution. It's a good thing. And so that's why I did that. There it is, right? And so I want you to read this for what day is today? Friday? So let's make it tomorrow. I'll be here right here. I'm going to come, right? No, it's supposed to snow like 30 feet. 35 feet. That's what I just read. 40 feet. 
And it's going to get cold. 40 to 50 below zero. With the wind chill, 1,000 below. <laughs> wind chill, right? Oh, a flat pin. She's put them all down and do it, right? Very good. You have to take the lid off. All right, so have this for Tuesday. Read it, and then you notice at the bottom there are three questions. The first two questions you need to answer with a question or with a sentence or two. They're pretty basic, but the third one, put a little bit more thought. A few sentences. Now you'll notice there's not much room there, is there? <laughs> so do not, well, you can, but I won't accept it. Try to crowd it in in the bottom. I know there'll be somebody, no, there's no room. Put it on a separate sheet. <laughs> and I know for almost all of us that's self-explanatory, but there always is going to be somebody. And I'm not looking at anyone in particular, but. <laughs> but, number two, or number four, actually. You also have to add a sentence. One sentence. On that half thing I gave you, on the bottom where I have to sum up things to look at when you read a document, the fourth one down has a sentence that used this format, this basic template. It's the fourth thing down here, as I just as luck would have it, put it up on the board. It makes. I just realized I put it makes sense. It makes sense. There's no grammatical rules in this box. It's still 1787. So, what I want you to do is this. Write this sentence, or, or as close as you get to the basic outline of it. So it makes sense that blank. So either the document or who wrote it in the document, like Madison in Federalist number 10, held this position. So the position in the article, what he says, because of something. And now that's something. It's going to be a few words. So it's going to be part of the sentence. You know, be, you know, just a few words. But you must either say historical context, some events at that time. That would lead him to have this point of view. Or the audience who he is talking to. Madison is trying to get this ratified. So think about that. Next, his point of view, and I'll get to a second who Madison was. So it might make sense. He would have this position. Or the purpose. This document, he holds this position because he wanted this to come out of reading this document. Does everyone got what I said? One of those four, not all four, just one of them. Now, to my personal point of view, if I was doing this assignment, I think the two easiest ones are historical context. If the events going on that would that would uh, um, influence him or purpose. To me, they're the ones that make the most sense. He's trying to achieve this. The reason I'm saying that is audience and purpose are almost the same thing, aren't they? Because the purpose is, you know, he's trying to get the, his audience. And point of view can be kind of hard. Okay, Madison, you see in a sec why he would have a certain point of view, but down the road, point of view might be hard for some people. You know, to figure out who it is and who wrote it. The purpose of what the document is trying to do, or it could be a political We'll get to those a little bit later, things like that. It's easier to know the purpose, or it's easier to know big picture stuff. This was going on, so he wanted this. He wanted a you know, we central through governments are going to be more shades of development. That'd be a terrible answer. Because it's wrong. But that's an example. Any questions on that? Would you like to do that assignment? Actually, it's a pretty good one. And the document's pretty interesting. But you have to know a couple things. Yeah, sure, we got more choice. I know. We have to do it. We have to do it. I have to assign it. Because of the <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what they want you to believe. It's the light. <laughs> By the way, never trust anyone who does air quotes. Okay, with that. Or what if they do this? And now, and only, then you don't know what they've done. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> Let's go ahead and then let's go take your notes out. Let's go take your notes out. And this is due on Tuesday. 
it's it's pretty interesting. But you have to know what a faction is and think about what politics factions are different groups. Think about it. Tuesday. And one more thing, you have to know these two things when you read this. You have to know what a republic is, and you have to know what a democracy is. And a republic is government by whom? They're, they're people, but what kind of people? What are they? It's government by representation. You said all the king's good. Government by representation. It's government by representation. Whose pen is this? I'm too quick. Government by representation. Now, they could be chosen by voters, or they could be chosen by an elite few. They could be representatives of the... We are representatives of the people because we have more guns than they do, and we decided we're the representatives. But it's just government by representation. A democracy is the people decide. And if the people decide, what we mean here is everything's decided by a majority. That's majority rule. Majority rule. And in a democracy, the people decide everything. Everything. So it's not representatives, it's not executives, it's not people, it's the people decide everything. So we have votes on everything, every law. So it's really electoral voters in certain well, no, we're the United States is a republic. The United States is a republic. It's never been a democracy. But if the people have a little bit more voice, because this is the majority of the people, you can become more democratic. So in some ways, the United States can be called a democratic republic. But it's not a democracy because people don't decide everything. Yes? Um, I have to like, just want to sign up for another class. I know this on a newspaper article. And one of the things can the way they're voting, um, and they're not using like, the electoral college, they're using like, like, like ranking voting? Yeah, rank shorts voting. Yeah. yeah, is that more like a republic? Or is that more like a democracy? That's more democratic, yes. Okay. It's certainly not a democracy, but it's small. Right, but it's small. Yeah, so instead of voting for one candidate or one, you vote for... You like rank them, yeah. and if there's like a tie, you get rid of the lowest, you can get them. Yeah, it's actually... There's some ways it can be a pretty good system, I think. But mm -hmm. They said they said like the pros are really There could be some negatives, like too. The, yeah, they said the pros are the main. Um, like the independent parties more, but, you know, like they have a better chance. Because we have, and I'll tell you why today, why we, we have two parties for a reason. And there are, we have two parties just for a very specific reason. Not because of the two parties are better or anything, just we're stuck with it. So that's true. So do they still have the, well, Two senators or two voters or whatever, and obviously they have more than one candidate, but they still have the two electors. We'll get to that in a second. I'll get about the electors. So let's go to get to this. You have to know these things when you read that Federalist number 10, the United States Republic, and let's get back to the Constitutional Convention. We got that in the class yesterday, didn't we? The Shays' Rebellion. Shays' Rebellion led directly to the Constitutional Convention. I mean, direct one, Shays' Rebellion. And so, yeah, there's issues about, remember, inflation and deflation, and when the rebellion happened, they wouldn't close down what courts? The rebellion did? Debtor. Say it again? Debtor. Yeah, the debtor courts. And this, it's because people didn't have, when I told you this rebellion, because they didn't have what? Power. And what's power in this context? Politics. That's politics. Money has great influence on politics, but it's politics. Politics of power. And those, you know, usually what happens, yeah, the people with a lot of money end up having this disproportionate amount of power. You have those ways around that, but that's that's not what we have here. And so with that, this would lead directly to it. The system was kind of rigged, and but to the elite, it wasn't, boy, uh, people are don't have enough power. To they, their point of view, there's too much what? Did I say this yesterday? Yeah, too much democracy. The people have, or at least think they have, too much of a voice, and we got to shut them up. The word for, for democracy they would use over and over again was mobocracy. And I just want to be clear about it. You are the mob. All right, look around. Right? Right? Yeah, mob's pretty tough. So, Almost immediately, there's going to be compromises when those people met in secret. Did I tell you they met in secret? Yeah, they might be accused of being traitors. 
So the 55 members of the Constitu Constitutional Convention in what city? And the Philadelphia. So what? Hmm? Is it actually for the Philadelphia? Yeah. Actual Philadelphia? Secret mission. Oh. No, my, my wife has to go for a meeting there, meeting there, and I decided to tag along. So I'm going to go to Philadelphia. I'm going to miss a couple days of school. But I'm excited to go to Philadelphia. Because Philadelphia is a place I saw like, my first live lucky. All right, so back to this. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Which is, of course, and, and it's the murder capital of America. The scene <laughs> of Brazil. Huh? It is? Yeah. I thought so it goes so back to that in Chicago. Oh, my. Oh, my. A geographical standpoint besides just the city limits for that. Okay. So <laughs> we're not going to get the details about the murder capital. Moving on. <laughs> okay. So, the Constitutional Convention, here's the thing about the Constitutional Convention. Good place for ID. There's a face looking at me. No, you're fine. <laughs> and. She covers it. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. Almost immediately, the biggest issue was slavery. What did we do about slavery? And what did they decide to do? Kick it down the road. We'll worry about that at the end. We just legislatures do that all the time. Just watch what happens in Helena every other year when they meet. All the big issues they saw like in the last two days. And for three months, they debate stuff that most of it's not all that important. It's not going to pass. And all of a sudden, we got to get everything done in two days. They do that all the time. So, with that, the next big thing is going to be three compromises. One compromise we call the Great Compromise, because it's the greatest compromise ever. Great means big in this context. The thing was big states, small states. Big states wanted more representation because they were underrepresented in the articles. Small states were worried about being overshadowed. And out of this, two plans are going to come out. One plan is called the Virginia Plan. The Virginia Plan, Virginia is the biggest state, therefore, the big state plan. It's going to be written by James Madison. It'll be introduced by Edmund Randolph, who was a prominent Virginia politician, but Madison wrote it. The same guy who wrote Federalist Number 10. And the United States government would follow Madison's template. That is why Madison is going to be called the father of the Constitution. There were other people very much involved, George Mason and James Patterson and others, but James Madison. Gee, wouldn't that be kind of have something to do with this point of view then on getting the Constitution ratified. So, he wrote this plan as a way to strengthen it in favor of big states. And very briefly, it's going to be a bicameral legislature. Bicameral means two houses. Two houses. And I'll get to Tuesday why he wanted this. Two houses. And it's very simple reasons why. Upper house and a lower house. But by camera. But here's the big thing about both of them, and I should have said this earlier, I'm sorry. It's based on population. Representation is based on population. The bigger your state, like Virginia, Pennsylvania, and New York, the more members of both houses. The lower house will have the most, and then the upper house will have not as many, but based on population. And what he decided was this. Voters would decide the lower house. Now, nowhere in the Constitution does it talk about any kind of rights to vote. At least, yeah, and even now, it doesn't say a right to vote in the Constitution. Every state has different rules. And most states require what to vote. You had to have what? Yeah, some kind of property. So it could be money, too, but you had to have a lot of property. Some states have lower property requirements, like Rhode Island. Some states have huge property requirements, like the biggest was probably South Carolina. So this is basically the elite, mostly white men with a lot of property. They could vote, and then they will vote for members of the lower house. So to catch what's happening here, the elite will vote for the elite of the elite. That's what they want. So this is government by the elite. This is the elite. 
I should add, we'll come back to this idea down the road, but just to let you know, there is no constitutional right to vote today. Nowhere in the Constitution, that, including the amendments, say you have a right to vote. It says your vote cannot be taken away, but that's not the same as the right to vote. So that's why in some states people aren't allowed to vote. Or they make it, they can make it very difficult to vote. There's all kinds of registration and timelines and dates. So there's no right to vote. People say, I have a right to vote. Well, maybe we should, but that's not written. Back to this. Then the lower house will pick the upper house. So the elite of the elite pick the elite of the elite of the elite, right? And then the last one, there will be an executive, and the lower house will also pick the executive. And that's the plan. The lower house pick the executive. That's not what happened, but you'll notice that most people have no connection to the government, only a elite who can vote, and then so on. So all governed by the elite. The New Jersey plan will be the small state one. And this one is closer to the Articles of Confederation. In fact, it basically is. They keep the, anybody know, if this is bicameral, anybody want to guess what a one-house legislature means? What? What? Mono is good, but not mono. What's another word for one? Uni. The uni cycle. <laughs> huh? Say it again. New Jersey. That's my NJ. Is that a J? The New Jersey plan. One house. And it's still equal. So that didn't change. Big states didn't, of course, did not like this. And there would be an executive. We're not going to go into great detail about either plan, but it's basically just a, a changing the articles a little bit. There would be an executive, and you could probably guess who's going to choose the executive. This unicameral legislature would just choose one person. To the executive. So this is where we get the great compromise. It's also going to be called the Connecticut plan. And the Connecticut plan is basically taking Madison's template but compromising on the bicameral legislature. So it's taking Madison's template. So we got that. It's Madison's basic idea. He did not totally invent it, and I'll get to that Monday where a lot of this came from. So we have bicameral. Two houses. And what are the two houses? What's the upper house called? Anyone know? Say it again? The Senate. And the lower house? House of Representatives. Now, when you hear someone called to as a congresswoman or a congressman, they usually refer to a house. But they're both members of Congress. Yes. Is this the second compromise? This no, this is actually the Great Compromise. So we have the Great Compromise was we had two competing plans, the compromise was this. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so with that. Now, this is what they did. Now, this is our government today. Very you know, basic <laughs> way of looking at it. But we have the House of Representatives. This one, representation by population. The bigger your state, the bigger your state is, the more representatives. So clearly, Virginia had more representatives than Delaware. More representatives. And voters, we already talked about a little bit how hard this can be, but voters choose the House. Now, as a compromise to states, they decided that the Senate will be chosen by state assemblies. So the state legislature will decide the Senate. And so all the way up to 1913, people would be nominated in every state government, so like you know, 1900 in Montana, and then the House and the Senate of Montana would vote, whoever won that would become the senator from Montana. That's how they did it. In 1913, the Constitution was amended, the 17th Amendment, that allowed for the popular election, to let the voters decide senators. But that's not until 1913. So once again, we get the elite voting for the elite of the elite, and the elite of the elite voting for the elite of the elite of the elite. And the Senate, the compromise. 
Every state has how many senators? Two per state. So how many senators are there today in the United States of America? How many members of the House? Close. You're up about 200. 435. They cut it out an odd number. So there wouldn't be, technically it wouldn't be tied for people don't vote all the time, so that doesn't matter. And originally it's going to be apportioned. That's why there's a census every 10 years. That's mandated by the Constitution so they can apportion seats. In the 1880s, it was decided that our, our building's getting too big. We got to cut it off. So they cut it off at 435. And so that's why every 10 years they do a census and then they reapportion seats. So some states who gain population might gain a couple seats. Some states that lose population might lose a couple seats. The minimum is one. When I was your age, Montana had two members of the House of Representatives. But then in 1990, it's not that Montana lost population, but other places gained so much faster. We lost one. So we have one. We don't have so we two. have three votes. So. We'll get to that. We're on the right track. Yeah, three votes, two in the Senate. Uh, oh, wow, isn't that amazing? Montana has three votes in the Senate. So does California. Who is our representative? Who is our representative? Yes. Greg Gianforte. He's not running for re-election because he's running for governor. Yeah, it used to be Zinke. Yeah, Zinke, but Zinke, this is a couple years ago, but Zinke was appointed to the Secretary of the Interior by, by President Trump. Yeah. And so he resigned his seat. And then when he went under, what, 18 different investigations for for fraud, yeah. as Secretary, he had to resign that seat. I don't know what's going to come out of that. But... And who are Senate? Who's our senators? And what party is Tester? He's a Democrat party. He's Danes. And Danes is up for re-election this year. And, and we'll get we'll get to the Senate. Not this year, I'm sorry, next year. It's only 2019, isn't it? Next election. How about that? I'll talk a little bit more about that. Steve. So, this is what we have. Two per state. How many have representatives in California? Thirty-five. Say it again. Fifty-three. Fifty-three. Slightly bigger population. <laughs> Montana has a is one of the biggest. Actually, Montana is the biggest single seat, but California is still about fifty times the population of Montana, which is pretty mind-boggling, isn't it? That just shows you how big and empty most of Montana is, at least the people. What's about a long house? Yeah. <laughs> We should take a drive from Eastern Montana. No, the high line. There's also an executive. If you want to see how empty things are, we'll drive to Freud, Montana. And you'll know what empty is. You feel like you're driving off the end. There's an executive rank. Now, Madison wanted the House to choose this. But this was another compromise to appease small states and slave states who were worried that the big states would dominate the house. They were worried the big states would dominate. So, who would choose the president? Mm. No, voters still don't choose the president. It's electoral college. Remember this whole thing about elite choosing? Every state has a set number of electors. Oh, that's not even a word. How about this word? Electors. Who chooses the electors? State assemblies. And this is still the way it's done today. State assemblies. State assemblies. So the elite of the elite choose electors, which are the elite. And they go and vote. And whoever has the majority of electors becomes president. If nobody has a majority, where does it go? Yeah, it goes to the house. That's what Madison thought all the elections would go. Madison just assumed all the elections would go to the house. He thought the electoral college would die away. How many electors does each state have? How many electors does Montana have? Two. One. Three. 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 We can randomly name numbers in a minute. <laughs> three. Why does Montana have three? Because that's what we do in the House. House in the Senate. Uh, you combine the members of the Senate and the House in Montana. It has three. California has 55. 55. 
So that's how it works. So these was so basically the first presidential election in 1789. These state assemblies picked electors and they went to well, actually, someone to Washington D.C. It's hard to travel then, and they vote for the president. and They got the majority. So our two senators and our representatives are the no, they're not the electors. That's just how many electors we have. So who are our electors? the state assembly decides? We don't even do the right one. I thought you counted the votes. And then well, I'll tell you what happened. The beginning of the 1820s. State assemblies, not all of them, but there's a wave of more democratic feeling to give people more power. And state assemblies started allowing voters to choose the electors. You ever got that? The voters. It took a little while, but after the Civil War, every state allowed the voters to choose the electors. And you have all the issues about who can vote and who can't, that's the state issue. And so this is done by state assemblies. And so when people go in and vote, they're not voting for a president. They're voting for electors pledged to the president. Let me explain this real quick what happens. In Montana, and every state has basically this law. This, the legislature of Montana has decided that the parties who have enough support, and so the two main parties, they choose their electors. So the Democrats choose, choose three electors that are pledged to vote for the Democratic candidate. The Republicans choose three electors that are pledged to vote for the Republican candidate. Has everyone got that image? Democrats, Republicans. They each choose three electors. And so when I went in to vote in 2016, and I voted for either the Republican, which was which candidate in 2016? Trump. The Democrat, which was? Clinton. So when I voted for one of those two, I'm not voting for them. I'm voting for the three electors pledged to them. In California, they're voting for the 55 pledged to vote for that candidate. That's how it works. But they can still vote for whoever they want. Actually, yes, because it's federal. But but the Democrats are going to pick three committed Democrats, and the Republicans are going to commit three Repu uh, committed Republicans. So the odds are they're going to pick who they say. Yeah. Uh, so outside of the two main candidates, if somebody voted for like a third party, uh, who would if, if they're certified to be on the ballot, they too can pick electors. But this is why we have two parties. Because it's, this is what we got to get down. Mont or all elections in the United States are winner take all. So, who has the most votes in the House wins. Who has the most votes for the Senate wins. Who has the most votes here gets all the electors. So in California, all 55 votes in the Electoral College went to whoever won the popular vote in California. Who was that? Yeah, Clinton got over 60% of the vote. She gets all 55. And so what is it, 39 in Texas? Trump got all of those. Trump won Montana. He got all, excuse me, got all three. <laughs> Even if they went by one vote, one vote, they get them all. This is like Hmm? Even after they win the electoral part, no? they just all, all Congress says is they certify the vote. But the electors go vote. That's why there's winner take all, and that's why we have only two parties. Because if there's a bunch of different parties, doesn't it spread the vote around? Third parties will take away a vote from one of the other two parties. So let me give you an example, like the Green Party. The Green Party, there is a party called the Green Party. They have one candidates. But most people who are Green Party are probably closer to Democrats. So if, if a person decides, you know, I'm going to vote for the Green candidate, who are they helping? The Republicans. Because it takes away votes from the Democrats. The Libertarian Party is probably closer to the Republicans. If you vote for the Libertarian candidate, that helps the Democrats. So, because it's winner take all, third parties don't have much of a shot because people decide, I you know, as much as I might agree with one of those parties, I better vote for them. Does that make sense? That's why we have Democrats and Republicans. And that's why two parties doesn't really cover everything, does it? Tomorrow, well, tomorrow I'm not coming. I'm not going to be here. No, no. Getting lazy. Yeah. Say it again. So, 
No, not it was much the Democrats have always been a different kind of party because the Democrats always represented more uh, working class people. Uh, and but the big thing what happened to the Democrats was uh, and before the Civil War, the Democrats kind of began the party pro slavery. The, the party pro slavery. Yeah, that, and then I, I mean the Republicans were always the party. The, the Republicans were party of the elite from 1889. Yeah, that's when I heard that argument about that. Uh, the flip was over and he's slavery. It was, but it was much more complex. But we'll get to yeah. that. What do you want? You don't need to go to No, I, I 